I recently had the pleasure of playing the original version of Life is Strange for the first time, and despite the game being some six years old or so at the time of this video, I thoroughly enjoyed this 2015 title and was very fortunate that nothing was spoiled for me, not even the premise. Very naturally, we will be discussing major spoilers for the game, so if you somehow missed the Life is Strange boat after all these years just like me, and if you still want to experience this one-of-a-kind game for yourself, turn away now, because we're about to get into the thick of it, spoilers and all. But first I'm going to ask you, if you are jamming out to the content that I produce, subscribe to me, leverage the unrivaled power of that notification bell. And don't forget to leave your love in the comments. Come talk to me on Twitch, where I stream throughout the week, and we are always having the fun and engaging with each other in interesting and unique ways. After all, you never know what I'm going to come up with next. In the past six months, I have been introduced to choice-based games through the fantastic recommendations of my Twitch audience and Discord family. And while I enjoyed certain aspects of them, Life is Strange is the first choice-based game that I have wholeheartedly enjoyed with no complaints and no criticisms, especially in Life is Strange's ability to mask the inherent limitations of the genre. A choice-based game, in my opinion, should be so immersive that I as the player, as the experiencer of your story, should never be aware that I am moving within a fixed environment with limited options. I should have a good idea of what I am supposed to do at all times, controlling my character should be easy, and, outside of combat situations, no choice in the game should ever have a timer. So thank you, Don't Nod, for fixing all the things that bugged me about other choice-based games with a game you made way back in 2015. So, how do you say amazing in three words? Well, that's easy. Life is strange. From introducing me to the game's sympathetic protagonist Max, to shocking me with the game's time-rewinding premise, it was easy to get sucked into the world of Max's fish-out-of-water journey through Blackwell Academy. The story expertly grounds its time travel premise with the realistic gravity of navigating adolescence made more complex by the era of social media and viral videos, tackling such heavy topics as suicide and depression alongside its teen detective and butterfly effect motifs. From numerous references to Twin Peaks, to a Death's Head Moth nod, to Silence of the Lambs, foreshadowing perhaps one of the game's most chilling revelations. What? I knew there was something creepy about him when he made that comment about Kate. I was all about picking up what this game was putting down on every channel and every level. And when I wasn't surprising myself by remembering number combinations I had only seen once the day before, the game did a great job of surprising me in several powerful and emotional ways. While Life is Strange is a choice-based game, there really was no choice at the end in what was the right thing to do, from my personal perspective. In choosing to either save Chloe and condemn the town, or sacrifice Chloe and save the town, we are reminded of the notorious choice made by a certain character in another game many of us are intimately familiar with. You can call me Ozymandias if you want to, but sacrificing the few to save the many when those are the only options available is, to me, the only practical solution to avoid a zero-sum game when a win-win scenario isn't possible. Game theory aside, Chloe's death was the impetus for all of this. This entire game, this entire experience. Like an inescapable fractal pattern, the universe was telling Max over and over and over again. So it seemed only fitting to me, as an experiencer of the story, that Max's journey should end as it began, with acceptance of her best friend's death. Which brings me to my personal interpretation of the ending, at least as I experienced it. While there are important supportive elements to the narrative, such as whether we can save Kate and figuring out the mystery of what happened to Rachel Amber, the game is really, at its heart, about Max and Chloe. It occurred to me as I made my choice to accept Chloe's death and we were thrust once again in that bathroom that her death was the impetus for everything. 
The entire story emanates from this terrible moment. Was everything we had just experienced nothing more than a disassociative fantasy created by Max to protect her from that terrible trauma of being in that bathroom when her best friend was killed? Max's ability to rewind time suddenly starts out of nowhere the moment Chloe is shot. Is Max really just a normal girl without powers? traumatized by a terrible event, a trauma compounded by the guilt of having hidden herself in the stall instead of intervening, a trauma compounded by the horrifying realization that the girl killed was her best friend whom she hadn't seen in years, a trauma compounded by the guilt of not only losing touch with Chloe over the years, but returning to her hometown and not telling Chloe that she was back. Was this entire week just a fantasy of reclaiming that relationship? A fantasy of making amends for lost times and lost connection? A fantasy that attempted to insulate and protect Max from the true horror of what happened in that bathroom? A fantasy that, in the end, Max was finally forced to confront and face as such. Throughout the week spent with Chloe, there are certainly clues to suggest that much of what we are seeing is more fantasy than reality. From the dead birds, to the unexpected snow, to the massive beaching of whales, to the unscheduled solar eclipse, to the twin moons in the sky that no one seems to care about, to say little of the massive vortex coming to consume the whole whole town. We have to ask ourselves how much of any of this is truly real at all. Even the lyrics of the song playing during this heartbreaking ending, Forget the Horror Here, seem to suggest that's what Max has been trying to do this entire time. Indulging in a fantasy about saving her childhood best friend whom she never got to say goodbye to. The very fact that we can even consider this perspective, whether intended by the creators or not, reaffirms the narrative power of Life is Strange, as only good art can do, and I can't wait to discover what lies in store for me in the other Life is Strange games. If this video meant something to you, you can help me build something great by subscribing and sharing the good vibes and good spores of this content across the four corners of the internet. You can stay connected by joining my Discord and chatting it up up with me and other members of the Wolfpack, where we're always keeping it positive and focusing on the fun. Just click on the Discord link in the description, follow me on Twitter, and show me pictures of the wolf in your life. And don't forget that I have other videos that may provide you with something you didn't know that you were searching for. Until next time, I will catch you in the wilderness of the mental. Me